All right, so today I have another guest with me. We're talking about her recovery from longstanding low back pain, specifically SI joint pain and sciatica. And so you are really going to enjoy this conversation today because sometimes I think when we think of chronic pain, we often think of people who are really sick, who are on disability, who are just like debilitated. And for many, that is the reality. Like, you know, there is a lot of disability. There is a lot of, you know, very sick and ill people out there. Yet more often than not, chronic pain doesn't look the way that we would expect it to. And so most people that live with chronic pain every day of their lives, they look totally normal. They don't complain about it. They just go on with their lives. They go through life while experiencing physical pain and no one can see it. And most of the time, so chronic pain is for the most part invisible. And that invisible pain is so often overlooked. It's minimized and even normalized by our healthcare providers. So today I asked Hannah to join me who has struggled with stubborn back pain to talk about her experiences navigating her recovery journey from dealing with dismissive providers, getting conflicting explanations, getting everything from mainstream treatments to alternative therapies and measures to eventually regaining her identity back through a completely different approach. So welcome, Hannah. Uh, now, before we get into everything, would you mind telling everybody just about yourself and a little bit about about the pain that you were experiencing and how it started and when it started, kind of give us a little bit of background. Sure. Um, so I am 35. I have two kids that are six and 10. Um, my pain kind of briefly started a few months after I had my son. Um, it was it was definitely not as severe as it got to be. I would consider it pretty minimal at that time. Um, I saw a pelvic floor PT for eight weeks. Um, the pain went away and I didn't have any issues for, for a lot of time. I was really active. I've always been active throughout both of my pregnancies, never had an issue, you know, before that with what I would consider chronic pain. My, my most recent kind of like, I guess maybe a relapse with pain or resurfacing of this SI pain, uh, started about three years ago. There was no injury per se of, you know, I was lifting and I felt a sudden pain. Um, at this point, I was, I was still really active. I ran a lot. That was kind of what I love to do. It was a great stress reliever for me. Um, I lifted weights consistently. So I would say that I had a good foundation for movement, um, things like that. And so I kind of started having this, this pain again in my right low back and my SI joint area. I, um, I didn't give it too much thought initially. I, I kind of just ignored it, continued on with my exercises and things like that. Finally, I got to a point probably six months later where I was, I was finally like, okay, this pain is not going away. Um, I've ignored it. It's not getting any better. It's kind of just like nagging in the background. It's slowly starting to limit what I feel like I can do. This is a very similar experience to what a lot of people go through with back pain. It's like, you know, you've been lifting weight. So you just kind of like attribute it to that. Like maybe it's running, maybe it's just like everybody goes through back pain. So I'm just going to keep going on with my life and ignore it and hope that it goes away. And, but for three years, that was an ongoing issue. And so I can imagine you know, that was starting to take an, have an impact on your life. So like, what was that like for you? Like, what was that after three years impacting you physically, emotionally, you know, all of those different things? I think the biggest, when I look back, the, the biggest impact where I look back and I think I didn't realize how much pain I was in, um, is that I stopped running. Um, I started attributing running to pain and so I just kind of, in my mind was like, well, that's just not something that I'm going to be able to do probably anymore. Um, and just kind of kept trucking and was like, well, that's, you know, that's life that happens. You, you're not able to do everything you want to do. And so that was a, a big moment for me. But then over time, my activity levels continue to become more limited. And so things like walking lunges or any started with walking lunges, and then it progressed to any, uh, unilateral exercises. And then it progressed from there to not being able to deadlift. And so it just kind of started to seep into everything. Yeah. So like little by little chipping away at what you wanted to do and what you found joy in. And mm -hmm. uh, like you said, that stress relief was like running and lifting weights. And, and so I would imagine that had some sort of impact on your feeling as like your identity and who you are and what you enjoy doing. Yeah, it was a, 
it had always been a big part of who I was even before I had kids. So it was, you know, when you become a parent, you're holding on to those things that you enjoy outside of your kids. And slowly I was starting to lose that. And then I had also been a really active parent. So playing with my kids, running around with them outside, playing sports, those were things that were really important to me. You know, I wanted them to have those memories and over time starting to feel like, am I going to be able to run with my kids ever again? Like I, I'm so afraid to do anything, I'm afraid to just go play basketball, you know, for fear of what I'm going to feel like the next day. And so all these enjoyment factors, I felt like were slowly being taken away. Wow. Yeah. That's super scary. And, and, you know, not who you identify with as a mother and a person, you know, it sounds like you have that like athlete mindset of like, you know, you're very active, very active with your kids. So that's got to take a huge hit on you and your mm-hmm. emotional health and mental health as well. Um, in your journey, like searching for solutions and, and things like what were some of the biggest challenges and roadblocks that you experienced kind of over those three years of like, you know, mm-hmm. seeking answers? I felt like a lot of uh, quite a few providers that I saw, they either gave me very vague answers, they couldn't pinpoint what the actual issue was. And then I also kind of felt like I was put into these categories of acceptable pain. So if I go in and I'm saying, yeah, my back is just really hurting, my SI joint, I'm having a lot of pain, then the response was, well, you've had kids, you're a mother, of course your back is hurting the hormones when you're pregnant, it's going to cause that pain in your SI joint. And at this time, I'm thinking, I'm four years postpartum. You know, that response is not adequate. That's not good enough. It doesn't explain why I'm having this pain, especially for someone who doesn't generally complain of pain. Um, For me to seek out a doctor and go in and verbalize that I was having pain, it almost felt demeaning or dismissive Mm -hmm. because that was a big deal to me to say I was in pain and I I need help with this. So the the lack of specific responses about what was actually going on in my scenario, um, it made me feel alone, made me feel pretty helpless. Yeah. And so, you know, as you were seeing these different providers, what were some of the different things that you ended up going through? My, so I kind of, I bounced around to chiropractors for a long time because I think my, uh, that had always been my treatment of choice because it was a little bit more natural. Pretty quickly, I realized that I would feel better when I left, but then the next day or even later that day that I would still have that same pain. Um, From there, I went to, I did a pelvic floor program because I kind of followed this thought line of oh, if you're a woman and you have low back pain, then you have, you know, pelvic floor issues. Um, So I did that. And during this time is when I continued to see a decrease in my activity level. So I was kind of like, okay, well, that's not going to be the fix. So then I went to a PT. And then when I was with this PT for a period of uh, probably eight weeks, I mean, it really wasn't a large amount of time, but my pain level sharply increased and my activity level took a nosedive. So I had my most severe pain while I was seeing the PT. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you didn't, you didn't actually go down the route of like doing injections or nobody said anything about surgery or anything like that or medications or. Yeah. After I went to the PT and was in a considerable amount of pain, I, I finally went to a doctor and I had been pretty resistant to it up until that point, because I knew the response would be well, I can give you medicine. And I felt like that was a band-aid solution. So, but I went to see her and she said, well, I'll, I'll probably send you to PT. And I said, well, I've already done PT. And she said, okay, well then um, I'm going to send you for an MRI. I knew at that point, if I did that, I knew what that path was going to look like. They were going to send me for an MRI. I have no doubt that I they would have found something to say, oh, this is, you know, the originating source of your pain or we can do injections or we can do this, you know, up until that point, I didn't realize it, but I had watched my dad struggle with chronic pain all my life. Mm -hmm. And I saw that play out for him over and over again of going to doctors, looking for answers and not really ever getting any. And so I think that's why internally I was so resistant to that Avenue. And it was like my last resource. And I got the response that I thought I would. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Um, that you make that connection between what you saw your family go through and 
you know, now you're experiencing that. But I remember you saying to me, like, I never really identified as having chronic pain. Um, and I wonder if that's a part of it, like seeing your, yeah, through that and being like, no, that's, I don't have that. <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely. And so I grew up with chronic pain, you know, and I knew what that looked like. And I knew the limitation and activities and, and all these things. And I remember when I talked to you the first time, I said, I, I had this pain, but I don't really know if it's chronic pain. And, and you said, well, how long have you had it? And at that time I said, two years. <laughs> and you're yeah, like, that's yes, chronic. that's definitely <laughs> chronic pain. But yeah, I think in my mind, I, I just, I looked at myself and I thought, no, I'm, you know, I'm not in debil debilitating pain. You know, I'm able to walk and, you know, do activities at this time. So I'm not that, those are people that are really bad off. And so that was definitely a revelation for me to think, oh, okay, that's exactly what I have. Yeah. Which again, it's probably not great for your, like thinking about that in your identity and like going through yeah. that. I mean, it was a grieving process of like, okay, wait, so I do have this. But something I want to go back to is something you mentioned about like some of the things that the providers that you talked to had said to you, because like our providers say so many things in such a small amount of time. And as providers, I don't think we realize just how great of an impact those words have on people. I know for you, some of those things have really affected you. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about that? One of the uh, PTs that I saw, I came in one day because like I mentioned, my, um, my activity level really decreased while I was seeing her and my pain went, went really high. Um, so starting it, you know, I went in with this SI joint pain a few weeks in, I got to the point where I couldn't walk more than a few minutes without my foot going numb. And that's an alarming, um, sensation, you know, and, um, I was also waking up in the middle of the night with nerve pain on my back. And so I go in to see her really in tears, which is, you know, for a lot of people, that's hard to go into an office in tears saying, I'm in so much pain, like something's not right. I can't even verbalize it to you, but something is not right. And um, her response was, well, I think, you know, this is just a part of your journey now. And to be told that this is any way normal was, it was so frustrating, so discouraging, but I almost, I also felt like every time I went in to see her, and then her responses to me, they chipped away at my confidence of what I was feeling and what I was experiencing. At the time when I was seeing her, cause she was uh, definitely more of a alternative medicine PT. When I, when I mentioned that I was waking up in the middle of the night with nerve pain, she referred me to a naturopath doctor, said that I needed to go get lab work done, that it was probably my hormone levels. And then when I saw her and I was very upset, crying and pain, she kind of inquired about my experiences in the past, like if I'd had any traumatic events um, and I had. And so her response was that I likely needed to go see a, a trauma therapist. And so that was another confidence hit for me because I had experienced trauma in the past. Um, I'd lost someone unexpectedly and I had kind of walked through this grief process, but also worked really hard to walk through that. And so to me, the message was, you uh, can't overcome your experiences. Mm -hmm. um, you're a hostage to things in your life that you had no control over, which on a fundamental level, I don't think is true and I don't agree with. Um, so that was really frustrating to kind of, for her to say, are you sure you're in pain? Is mm -hmm. it not just, you know, you're, you're probably just upset. I think that's what it is, you're upset. And so that kind of went back to me feeling just like, wow, this is so demeaning to kind of put all of this out there and then be told, are you sure that this is what it is? You're sure that you're really in this pain? Yeah, it's very minimizing. And that whole, like your whole story, your whole journey has been like minimizing, normalizing, like it's fine, it's normal. Mm -hmm. And now it's actually not, it's actually your trauma. It's everything that you've been through. We're just going to overlook like all of the possible physical aspects of this and just say like, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of the, your own fault because you haven't been able to deal with this properly. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I'm curious if you felt like this resistance in, okay, on one hand, like maybe they're right. Like maybe it is all kind of in my head. And then on the other mm -hmm. hand, you're like, no, screw that. <laughs> like yeah. I, I refuse to accept that and mm -hmm. want to keep fighting. Like, did you kind of experience any of that? Yeah, I definitely did. Cause I feel like when you're sitting there, you kind of take what they say is gospel. Like this is this person who's supposed to have the answers. They're supposed to be there to help me. And then I remember 
just kind of looking at all of these options that she had given me, like go to this doctor and to this doctor and to this doctor and thinking, okay, well, if I want to be better, then this is, you know, what I need to do. And then also stepping back and thinking, all I'm going to do is parcel out my confidence to all of these different doctors that are going to not give me an answer of how to make this better. You know, I, I feel really fortunate that, you know, I said that I was kind of put into these acceptable pain categories of being a mom or, you know, my, my profession is um, sitting at a computer all day. So I'm a desk worker. Mm-hmm. I had spent years of that time really thriving and doing well. And so I, I at least that had that argument in my mind of, I know that's not true. I know that because I'm a mom, I don't have to deal with back pain because I've lived that. And so just kind of standing on my own experiences of saying, I know this is not normal. What you're telling me is not a, is not a viable answer or solution. Yeah. Do you think that contributed to this like desperate feeling of like, I need to find what is wrong. I need to mm-hmm. find like the injury and what is actually happening here. Cause I know yes. in my heart that something is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, you, I spent a lot of time on Google mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of looking at the muscles, looking at the ligaments in my back, trying to pinpoint where this pain was coming from and watching way too many YouTube videos of fixes for this pain. And, and I think also the thing that I notice is social media is full of quick fixes and this one move will fix your pain. And so it kind of built up this thought process in my mind of, I just need to do this one thing right. I just need to figure out what that one thing is that's going to fix my pain. Is it, you know, X, Y, and Z or, um, and just getting on the internet and trying to figure out what could be the cause of the problem is so overwhelming in itself Mm -hmm. because then you can get on so many different paths. And, and at one point I kind of took a step back and I told myself, I can't, I'm not going to let myself Google anymore Mm -hmm. because it, it almost felt like it made my pain intensify. And so I was feeling that it was not benefiting me in a, you know, a really tangible way. I think the internet is a black hole of Mm -hmm. everything. It's a mix of everything. Like some of it is okay. Some of it's good. Some of it's questionable. You know, you don't know who's sharing the information and if it's, if it's a reputable source and then Mm -hmm. how much of the woo-woo stuff is like legit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Because some of when you're desperate, you're like, "I I don't really care at this point. Like, I'll do the woo-woo if I have to. Yeah. I'll, but yeah. I'll hum, I'll hum to activate my vagus yeah. nerve. That's going to somehow like, cure my back pain or something. <laughs> I know we've heard it all. So in the black hole of the internet, I'm <laughs> sure you had heard some things about the nervous system. And so <laughs> I'm curious, like before doing this program, what were some of your thoughts or beliefs about the nervous system and what, what kinds of things did you expect to find in the program? Um, so in my kind of searching, I remember really attaching to the psoas and I was like, I, it's the, so it's my psoas muscle. It's tight. I need to just release it. Um, and then I remember reading this article and it was talking about if you're not addressing what is causing your psoas to become overactive or tightened, then you're just going to forever be releasing it. And I remember thinking, but I don't understand what, what could cause your muscles to be tight, you know, like what is activating that? And then I kind of, on that same line, I, I was reading chronic pain is not a muscle issue. It's a nervous system issue. And so reading that, and then kind of thinking about my understanding of the nervous system, which was pretty limited at the time. I mean, my immediate thought is, well, yeah, the nerves, you know, our nerves are a part of our nervous system. We've all heard of the fight or flight response, but I didn't understand what role that really plays. And so, I mean, honestly, I didn't know what to expect to find in the program, but I knew, I knew what to expect from other sources. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was not going to be beneficial. I knew that they didn't have the answer. And so if my limited knowledge is, it has the ability to be expanded, Mm -hmm. then I want to do that. And I want to press into that. Um, Just because I don't know it doesn't mean that it won't be helpful. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I just had this hope that maybe this thing that I didn't understand was playing a bigger role than I realized. Yeah. It's like a leap of faith a little bit. Like, yeah. Yeah. I trust that this is science, but also I don't get right. it and that's okay. I will. Yes. Get it, yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. So what did you learn and you know, what were some of your biggest takeaways as you went through the program in terms of just like knowledge gained and insights about your pain and what you were experiencing? 
So just foundational level of what the nervous system does was a huge game changer for me. It's kind of amazing to think back of all these years of schooling and, and I knew very little about what that does for our body and, you know, the role that it plays. So that in and of itself was a game changer to understand how it was directing my body and how it was directing my muscles and affecting my pain. And so that was a big takeaway for me. But the other thing that I really clung to while I was still in pain was that pain is not a good indicator of injury. I'm curious, like, cause like, I think so many people with low back pain have a hard time making that connection because they're, we traditionally view it so much through the structural and mechanical lens. And mm -hmm. it's so hard to see, like, how does the nervous system actually contribute? If I, I mean, have, I have something going on in my back, like we know that, but mm -hmm. I can't, like so many people, I think struggle with that connection of like how that nervous system is actually playing a role and being a contributing factor do you feel like it does contribute and there's still like the physical aspects and it, it is both in a sense, I guess? Yes. Yeah, I, I do. And, and I, one of the ways that I started to see this was actually comments that my husband was making when my pain was at its highest, he would say, why are you walking like that? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, your gait has changed like completely. And so in a way I felt like so vindicated, you know, that I'm like, oh my gosh, this is not in my head. Like something is really happening in my body, you know? And, um, and then around that time, just before that, the PT that I was seeing said, I think that you just need to not be walking so much. Mm -hmm. But I started to see all of these correlations in what I was taking as fact mm -hmm. that was um, harmful to my body and how my body was reacting Cause that was the, that was the biggest thing to me where I saw it. And I was like, okay, my body thinks it's protecting me. Yeah. That's when I started to see it, um, started to look at through the, look at it through the lens of my body's trying to protect me and my muscles are responding. So how do I undo that? Yeah. I think like looking back and I think this happens with so many people with the dismissive nature of the healthcare system. And then like things that people providers will say to you, people will say to you, previous experiences, like with your, with your dad, ex your, your experience seeing and witnessing chronic pain, it creates like little messages of mm -hmm. fear. Like it's telling you like, Hey, nobody's listening to me. Everyone's normalizing this. I really believe something is wrong. So you have to keep, like protect yourself. And, and so like your nervous system takes that impact. And then things that our physical therapists and our chiropractors say like, you know, oh, this is out or this is tight or, mm -hmm. you know, something's wrong with this, uh, that all contributes back into like, okay, I'm not safe. I need to protect. And like, yeah. And then walking, like you're walking funny. <laughs> like, are you, you're like, oh, am I protecting something in, in the way that I'm walking? Or maybe that's the way that my body's responding to protect me. And then that maybe even is contributing back into the dysfunction, you know, structurally and mechanically, you know, because if mm -hmm. you're walking kind of off. It all comes down to, and this may not be the word that you would have used, but it's all in a sense, it's like fear. It's little pieces of, oh yes, definitely that contributes to that need to protect. Mm -hmm. And I started to, the more I started to learn about the nervous system, the more I would notice my fear and completing activities. And so like, let's say for example, running, if I thought, you know, I'm going to go for a run today. And I'm like, oh, I can't run because, you know, it's going to, I'm too afraid that it's going to cause pain or I can't even run outside with my kids because I'm afraid that it will cause pain. Um, and so I started realizing how afraid I was to do any activity. Mm -hmm. And then also in turn, recognizing that that was having an impact in my body. So it was kind of like the cycle of, mm -hmm. of um, response, you know? Yeah. From a nervous system standpoint, I think a lot of people hear that and they, just like you were like, that sounds really vague. I don't really know what that means, but okay, great. Like fight or flight makes sense. What did you learn from a practical standpoint, like in your time in the program, what did you learn and do that to you seem to have like the greatest impact on your fear, your pain, your functional ability, all of that stuff? So the exercises that you implemented in the program that I found to be the most beneficial um, were the motor imagery drills and I would just start really small. And so I, I kind of looked at it from the standpoint of I'm afraid to do all these activities. I'm just going to remind myself, I'm just going to remind my body what it feels like. I would do things like imagine myself stretching my arms over my head with no pain. And so really 
started small with that. And then the biggest thing for me was to get to the point where I could imagine myself running with no pain because that was one of my greatest joys, you know, was running. And it, it took a while to kind of remind my body what that felt like. And then the other drills that I did a lot were the localization drills. Mm -hmm. And so you referenced a lot about your toolbox, you know, having your toolbox. And I kind of started to think about it as um, those were some of my tools that I would use. So when I was uh, in a lot of pain or, you know, maybe I was having a flare, those would be the tools that I would access. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would do the localization drills and I would see a pretty immediate drop in pain, specifically the sciatica. Um, I noticed a big difference in that. And then the motor imagery drills, like that's something that I can do in bed. At, at the end of the day, if I'm laying in bed, I'm in, in pain, then I would just lay there and I would do some of those drills. And again, I would see an immediate drop in pain. Mm -hmm. um, and so seeing the effect of that is also very motivating, you know, you, just to feel your muscles kind of relaxing and letting go of that tension. Uh, it kind of gave me some hope. It, I mean, it definitely gave me some hope of, okay, this is, I'm, I'm on the right track. You know, yeah. I'm getting somewhere with this. I'm, my body is not in pain all the time. My back's not in pain all the time. And the biggest, you know, takeaway we were talking about the takeaways is I think was actually confidence mm -hmm. of gaining the confidence to know that I have the tools to dr address my pain going to different doctors, I felt like I was slowly letting that go. Like I was parceling out my confidence and just understanding the nervous system and going through the program and walking through the drills. It started to make me feel like I have the answers. I can address my pain. And, you know, I always thought once I'm pain-free, then I'll be confident again. And then I started to feel like that's not the way it's happening. You know, it's the more confident I am, the less pain I'm feeling. That, you said that so beautifully and and that's such an important realization I think anyone listening can really take that as like a tip because mm -hmm. it's like yeah it's not like the end goal is confidence you have to get the confidence along the way to mm -hmm. combat the fear and the fear contributes to the pain so it's like it's confidence is the antidote to fear and I think like you said having the science builds confidence of like okay I know what's going on in my body I feel like mm -hmm. I have a deeper understanding so I'm not just constantly searching the black hole of all of these yeah. things. What is the injury? What is really wrong with me? And then you get the practical steps so that you can actually start making an impact. And when you see that having an impact, it's like, okay, it's very validating to say, okay, my nervous system really is a contributing factor here and mm -hmm. I'm on the right path. So yeah. I uh, recently, we had gone on a walk with my family and my daughter wanted to have a speed walking contest, you know? <laughs> so we're, we're speed walking and I can kind of feel my back, you know, like tensing up a little bit and I started having these thoughts of, oh man, am I going to pay for this tomorrow? Is my back going to be hurting? By the time we get home, I'm in a little bit more pain and thinking, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And then I thought if I'm in pain, then I know what drills to do. Mm -hmm. I know how I can address it. And, you know, immediately with that thought of stopping myself from spiraling, but the confidence of, but I know how to address it immediately my pain dissipated. Mm -hmm. And so just kind of seeing that and be a, being reaffirmed in that was was really neat. It, it's remarkable how big of an impact that just that change in thought can have on those symptoms uh, immediately. So how has things changed since you've been implementing this approach? And basically, yeah, what were some of your results? So the biggest thing that I noticed initially is that my sciatica, like I I remember walking around one day and thinking, oh my gosh, I don't have sciatica down my leg into my calf and my foot. And that was amazing. Um, but also general decrease in low back pain and SI joint pain. I have picked up running again, which is, you know, you can't even put it into words when you're able to do the thing that you love again. And it, initially when I started it, I had gotten so used to being hyper-focused on what pain sensations I was feeling. But over time of just, you know, running a little bit, like you say, like pushing to it, not through it. So I'd run a little bit. And then I, I was running the other day and realized that I felt, you know, quote unquote, normal. I felt like I had a normal stride. My gait was normalized. And that was a, a really big win for me. And things like doing the things that were on my no list, like lunges and um, deadlifts and things like that, being able to start doing those again have been really exciting, feeling like you're finding yourself again. Yeah. So you have your, your identity back in your, yeah. like 
you're not stuck with like, well, you have to just do yoga and breathing on the floor and do Pilates mm -hmm. from now on because that's all you yeah. do. You're not. Yes. <laughs> if you could go back in time and go talk to Hannah from a year ago or two years ago, what advice would you give her? What would you say? I think one, I would tell her if you feel like a provider is not listening to you, then go with that instinct. Mm -hmm. And if you feel like you're in pain, then you're you're in pain. It's okay to say you're in pain. And I think that I would say, you know, in regards to the nervous system, clue into how you feel when you are going to these doctors and they're telling you that you can no longer do these activities. Is your pain less or more? Mm -hmm. um, and to try to take into those factors of, of like letting your body be your feedback. And then from there saying, that's your nervous system, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, cause I think it, even me, I'm, it, it's difficult to really explain, you know, how that, that plays a role. But looking back now, I can see the, the kind of feedback that it was trying to give me. And I would say, you're going to get better. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel like yourself again. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. So yes, absolutely. Anyone listening, I think that's excellent advice from someone who's gone through this. Like don't listen to the providers who are going to minimize and dismiss, listen to your body and trust that what your body is telling you is legitimate and have hope that recovery is possible despite what they want to tell you. I love that you said, listen to your body because when they dismiss us, you know, say like, oh, it's just normal. It's nothing. It's your trauma. You start doing it to yourself. You start minimizing it yourself. And then your nervous system just goes, excuse me, listen, <laughs> I'm trying to tell you something. And so it just, it promotes that fear. So it's like, it's like telling somebody like, don't worry. You're, you're trying to like tell your nervous system, like, don't worry. It's okay. Mm -hmm. But really that nervous system is going to go, excuse me. No, I actually have something to say. And I have something I need you to hear. And mm -hmm. uh, it fights back. And until you tune in and listen to that body and give yourself what it needs and that kind of like that confidence back, like we're talking about, then it will, you know, start making changes and, and having some really cool results. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. I love hearing your story because I think this is such a common experience and I'm hopeful that somebody listening will be like, oh my God, this is so my story and will be inspired and have hope as well. But I really appreciate you sharing everything. Is there anything like last minute thoughts or anything that you'd want to share with the listeners? Um, give it time. You know, it's a learning process and um, it's learning and implementation process. And so celebrate little wins and just kind of keep track of those little things that you never thought you'd be able to do because those are important. Yeah, it definitely does. It takes time. There's no quick fix. Mm -hmm. like what the internet and our culture yeah. will tell you here's the pill fix it <laughs> yeah. Yeah. this one exercise yep just the one just the one thing yeah. the beginning. I was looking for that one thing and it's not it is it is a journey and it is various different factors that come along the way so mm -hmm. yes thank you for sharing everything you're welcome so lovely to have you on and and share your story and I'm sure that others will be very inspired to hear everything that you shared so thank you you're welcome all right, everybody listening, thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye.